Hi everybody and welcome to another episode of Gaffering Gear. Today we're having a look at this light by ProLight. I assume that's pronounced ProLight. And this is their Orion 300. So yes, it's another light that can take Bowens mount accessories. The point of difference between this and other Bowens mount lights is this is not monocolor or bicolor. This light actually uses red, green, blue, amber, cyan and lime color emitters to generate full color gamut lighting. Now we're going to be covering a lot in this video, so in the description below you can find a timed index and skip to the sections that interest you. Alright, so before we get underway, just the usual disclaimers, Dave Donaldson did send me this t-shirt for free and I do get to keep it. Alright, these guys also did send me the light for free and that doesn't affect my opinion either and they get no say in the edit. Alright, so let's start off the review with price and what you get. Alright, so let's go through uh, what you get uh, in this kit. So the Orion 300, you're looking at about 3000 Australian dollars and it sells for about 2500 US dollars. You get a uh, beautifully constructed, very strong bag. You get the uh, lamp head, of course, uh, or the head, it doesn't have a lamp in it anymore. Now you can choose whether you put your lock off on the left or the right side, so that's something I really like. Uh, you get the controller. Now the controller has the power supply built into it, so it's uh, very nice and very compact and V-mount batteries already on the controller, so less bits and pieces required to get it set up. You get a clamp to put the controller onto the stand, which uses a V-mount, so very, very simple. Easy as that. All right, next up we'll have a look is our dish. So you get um, the one faceted dish with the unit. Let's get into our cables. All right, so you get your, um, your AC power cable, Nutrix connector, so it's not gonna accidentally disconnect on you. Um, and the cabling is made from a, um, a silicon or a rubber cable, so it is heat resistant. So you could use it up in a lighting grid uh, and have it near hot lights and it won't be a problem. Uh, next up is the head lead cable, which has some seriously uh, solid connectors on it. They are serious cables. Um, the only criticism I've got is um, manufacturers seem to just make three meter head leads. You know, gaffers want to get lights higher than three meters, so I'd like to see longer head leads from all manufacturers. Uh, you also get a safety chain, and you get a, I assume this is a wristband. All right, so uh, let's get into it. Okay, so what we'll do is a bit of a run through, so that'll also cover the pros. Then we'll talk about the negatives and then we'll have a look at some of the uh, attachments for it. So this is a gobo projector, very high quality optics. Okay, so to turn it on, you've got a big button on the side there and then the unit boots up. And we'll start off by having a look at the CCT mode. All right, so you've got three parameters of adjustment and three knobs, so very straightforward. So the Kelvin range is a staggering 2000 Kelvin all the way up to 20,000 Kelvin. Now, uh, towards the end of the scale, your adjustments are in 100 Kelvin, and down the bottom end of the scale, your adjustments are in 50 Kelvin. So you've got a heap of adjustment. You've also got a full plus green adjustment as well. So from 100% uh, to 100% either side, with zero being in the middle. And the last knob is your brightness. Now, to give you some idea of the brightness of this unit, uh, it comes in at 86% brighter than the Aperture 300X, and that's with them both with the dish on. So I want to compare it to a bicolor light because it's not a monocolor light. Now let's have a look at the HSI mode. And to change modes, you press the mode button in the top right hand corner. Now the HSI mode has three parameters of adjustment. Your brightness, your hue angle. So you see there's a little indicator there spinning around the circle and our saturation, which is how much white light we mix in. So as you can see, it's a very, very easy mode to operate. Now one advantage this has over other HSI modes is we can select our white point that's in the center. We simply press a left knob, and now we can select our CCT. Press the back button to exit. That's now our white point, and from there, we can mix our colors in. So 
So the next mode up is the gels mode. So let's take a look at that. Now on the screen here, it's telling me that I've got my Roscoe gel selected. I'm at 100% brightness. I'm at a 3200 Kelvin base and I've got gel 99, which is chocolate selected. Now chocolate, uh, back when I used to use gels, actual physical gels, chocolate was my favorite gel because I do a lot of corporate uh, and commercial sort of work. And if you're doing an interview in an office with a white wall, it looked pretty boring, but um, I could throw a chocolate gel up and it was not offensive. It wasn't anybody's corporate colors. It didn't distract from the people. It was just a nice removal of white. So it's one of my favorite gels. Anyway, getting back to this. So our sensor knob allows us to hard switch between 5,600 Kelvin and 3,200 Kelvin. And if I want to select my gel, I press the back button. Okay, now I can use my um, other knobs here to select whether I'm Lee or Roscoe and I can select the, um, the type of gel I'm using. So the, the selection of gel uh, types within that brand. Or alternatively, I can just scroll through each gel individually using the end roller here. And when it gets to the end of the menu, then it will go to the next gels menu. As you can see, there are hundreds of gels here. I haven't done a count, but it must be close to 400 gels in total. The next mode is source mode, and source mode is to match or to simulate uh, real world lights, uh, non-film and television industry lights, so things like car park lighting, for example. Okay, let's take a look. All right, so in the main menu, I can uh, select my brightness, and if I want to change my source, I press the back button here. All right, so this button here will uh, go to my family groups, so up the top there, top menu, so incandescent. I scroll across, I can go to the fluorescent grouping, uh, discharge grouping and other. Or alternatively, I can just scroll down the list and when it gets to the end, it'll go to the next selection. So my favorite ones for these are things like this, uh, the discharge lights. Um, if I'm doing, say, um, a job at night time or it's meant to be night time, we're in a set that's uh, meant to be uh, an urban environment. Moonlight coming through a window can look a bit fake. Uh, so I like to use, uh, you know, simulate street lights. Where I also use this mode is, say I'm doing a shoot outside and we're meant to have a moonlight, but I can't get the light high enough that it looks like a moonlight. So I just chuck something like this on and instead of looking like a moonlight, it looks like it's a street light instead. The next mode we'll have a look at is effects. And fire is always a good place to start because that's one of the hardest effects to pull off. So a lot of light engines don't have gentle roll-offs on their fire effects. So yeah, that looks okay to me. To make it believable though, I think you need more than one lamp head. But yeah, that's got, uh, got nice sweet roll-offs. It looks very believable. Okay, let's have a look through the uh, menu system now. Okay, so uh, the button on the right here, you can play, pause the effect or even turn off the effect and then turn it back on. So that's uh, something that's quite handy. And uh, this knob here is the brightness when you're in the main menu. Any other parameter that comes up like speed here is your center knob. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. Now all, the, um, all your commands or all your options are written up on the screen here. So if I press back, as it says here, I can get a list of all my other effects. So as you can see, we've got quite a few. Now let's pick something that uh, has quite a few parameters in it. So let's go um, club, club a light. Let's click on that. Now, if I want to change my parameters, I press the silver button down and up comes my list. So I can select uh, how many colors I want and I can select the saturation. So that's pretty much the effects mode. So uh, heaps of options there to choose from. Now, the last mode of operation is your individual channels mode. So you can select the values for red, green, blue, amber, cyan, and lime. Now, with all of the modes, you can do up to 20 saves in total. Okay, so you can save 20 settings from different modes and recall them. So let's quickly run through how to do that because that's very straightforward. All right, let's get very random here. So I'm in HSI mode. So let's, uh, let's select some random uh, color. And what we'll do is we'll change our white point to something crazy. Um, there we go, that's pretty, that's pretty funky. All right, now if I wanna save this, I then 
hold down the preset button. So I'll just keep my finger on that. And up it comes, do I want to save into spot two? All right, so it gives you uh, it gives you the option to save in the next available spot. So spot one's obviously taken. So it prompts me, do I really want to save this? And let's save it into spot two. Okay, so uh, let's do that. Let's hit yes. And that's now saved. Now, if I want to recall, I just hit the presets button and up comes my list. So that's the one we just saved. And as you can see, all the information is correct. We've got a, a hue, a saturation, all those values. Now, if I scroll down, we'll come to other ones that I saved earlier. And as I scroll through, you can see that they preview. So you can actually not only read the information, but you can visually see if it's the one you're after. Now, if I wanna delete something out of this menu, I just hold the preset button down until that turns red. Then I select the, uh, the option I want to delete. Let's select the one we just saved. Let's delete that. Press the rocker down. Do I want to delete? Yes. The next thing we'll have a look at is the menu system, but I'm not going to go through the whole lot. I'm just going to go straight to things I think will be of interest. All right, so let's have a look through. All right, so to get into menu, just press the menu button. Let's have a look at light control. So I'll click on that. Uh, light modes, well, we won't bother with that because we've already covered it, but you can select your dimmer curve. So that's pretty cool. So let's back out of there. At any point you want to go backwards, you just hit the back button. Network settings. All right, so this is of uh, a particular interest. So DMX settings, let's go into that. Uh, DMX address, that's pretty straightforward. Work mode, uh, there is a master and slave mode. Now, I only have the one light, so I can't test the master and slave mode and see how good it is, but it is there. All right, so let's go and have a look at the next option. That's our protocols. So this will be of interest to gaffers. There are lots of professional uh, level protocols in here, loads of them. All right, so let's hit back. And the next one is uh, DMX loss of signal behavior. So you can set what happens there. All right, so that's the run through done. And as you can see, it's a very feature rich light and it's got some amazing color science behind it. Considering it doesn't have a wide emitter or any wide emitters, it's doing really well. So let's go over the build quality uh, very quickly. So let's start off with the controller. Um, the controller is very solidly built. That's all, all metal. Um, v mounts go directly on. Now, in terms of uh, power consumption, the maximum AC power draw apparently is 320. Uh, watt, so it probably maximum power draw of batteries would probably be 300 watt. It runs off standard 14.4 or 14.8 volt V mounts. Uh, build quality is fantastic. It's it's all metal. There is one weak point on it uh, though, and that's this bit here of the stirrup. So if you do go a bit crazy with your attachments, I tried to put on the massive Aperture F10 Fresnel, and that has uh, damaged it down here. So you see this rocking. It didn't rock like that before, so I overloaded it. Um, I had a feeling it was going to overload, but if I didn't do it in the review, I'd have 20 people asking me and I'd have to message them all back. So um, yeah, that's, that's probably a weak point in terms of the build quality, but in terms of everything else, it is really, really well built and well finished. All right, so let's quickly go over how this thing mixes its colors together. So it's got six color emitters, no white emitters, and mixes them all together to generate white light. So it does this through this little mixing lens here. So behind here, you've got your six groups of emitters, and this little lens is diffused, so it mixes all together at that point. Now, because it's a small point, you do get uh, reasonably sharp shadows, but because it's diffused, they're not razor sharp. So the best way for me to explain it is to say, imagine a dado light, and you've got a, a piece of 216 full diffusion sitting in front of the lens behind the barn doors. That's about the sharpness you get. So it's gonna be sharp, but not razor sharp. Okay, so let's uh, turn off the house lights and fire this up. So as you can see here, we do have one shadow, but it's not razor sharp. You don't get hairs on my arm, for example, now, just to show there isn't any problems here with barn door cutting uh, close to the unit, I'm gonna put on a set of aperture barn doors. So these are felt lined and a black dish, so you only get the uh, one light source. Okay, so we can barn door cut no problem. All right, so I've got this set at 2000 Kelvin and I'm gonna go through the Kelvins. I'm gonna do a Kelvin sweep. So you can see we've got very uh, consistent shadows all the way through the Kelvins. 
So we're going uh, 2000 uh, all the way up to 20,000 Kelvin. And if I go into the HSI mode, uh, same thing. We've got uh, consistent shadow quality all the way through our colors, uh, regardless of what's set. Now I've just backed off to a distance of two and a half meters away from the wall to show you what sort of cuts we can achieve. And I'm just gonna go through the colors again. And as you can see, it's a pretty consistent uh, beam cut, regardless of the color. Okay, so let's get into the negatives with this unit. And I'm pretty certain most of you would have heard the first negative and that is the cooling fans. Um, they are very, very loud. I think that's gonna be the big Achilles heel of this unit. Now, what makes this really frustrating is the options in the menu. With low, medium, and full speed, I can't hear any difference at all. Now, if you set low or medium, the light will eventually get hot and then go to automatic fan mode anyway. If you select the off option, the fan does turn completely off and give you absolute silence but after a couple of minutes, it'll turn on to automatic. So this is definitely a hardware issue. So it's not gonna get fixed with a firmware patch. So I hope they realize that it is important and change the fans over to something more quieter. Now the next negative, depending on how you use the light, is the lens here on the front. Some of you might have noticed, it doesn't go particularly wide. I reckon it only goes 50, maybe 55 degrees. In fact, adding or removing the reflector makes hardly any difference to the beam angle. Now when you put the reflector on, there's such a small amount of light hitting the dish that you only get an increase in light level of 17%. Now where I think this is a negative is if you were trying to use this with a softbox modifier. This does not have enough spread to evenly light a softbox. And this is a real shame because the ProLight Octodone is beautifully constructed. In fact, if you're looking for an Octodone for a Bowens mount, you should consider one of these. It has an elegant push button release. Its fabric is beautifully sewn and completely neutral. No color hues anywhere on the fabric. And look at the craftsmanship that has gone into the baffold. Now using the modifier without the baffold, you can clearly see the light hitting the front. But with the baffold, there is a minimal hotspot, just not a lot of light level anymore. The other modifier they make is this lantern. Having full color control over a lantern is awesome if you've ever tried to gel one. But if I change my exposure up, you can see the hot spot in the front. Now, if I stick my hand inside, you can see that my hand does not cast a shadow on the side wall. That indicates that all the light hitting the side wall is actually light that's bouncing off the front. So you can see here, as I pan it, there's a massive drop off in light level, which sort of defeats the purpose of using a lantern. So the only reason I think this is a negative is because it is a bow and S mount. People are going to expect this to behave much the same way as a COB light. They're going to expect that if they take the reflector off the front, they can use it as a psych light and light a large wall. Well, that's not going to happen. And they also expect that if they put a softbox modifier on the front, they can use it for that as well. Now, this light isn't going to hero at any of those things. Now, my next negative with these is these three knobs, particularly the two black ones. They're just not tactile enough. They're free rolling and very, very sensitive. So if you've got shaky fingers like me, you dial in a Kelvin, take your finger off, and it's changed. It's driving me absolutely mad. Now, as a sensitive new age gaffer, I know that violence isn't the answer, but on a couple of occasions, I've come really close to punching this thing. The next negative for me with these is their color accuracy when they're dimmed below 20%. The rest of the time, it's actually quite extraordinary. I'm gonna give you 5,600 Kelvin as an example. At full brightness, when I dialed in 5,600 Kelvin, I got 5,604. And if you have a look at the white point accuracy, it is right on the Planckian curve. However, it's a different story at 10% brightness, over 300 degrees Kelvin out, with a delta UV score of minus 0.0072. Now the next negative for me is a temporary one. At the moment, this doesn't have any dedicated hard light modifiers that make it a no-brainer purchase for a gaffer. Something like a decent Fresnel, for example. So I've given it a go with other Fresnels. The first lens I tried was the Aperture 2X, and it didn't spot too well. But it did increase the brightness from 2510 lux to 3740 lux. 
Next, I tried the Forza Fresnel. That also didn't optically line up. It had a very noticeable hotspot and any bundle cuts were convexed, but it did spit out a staggering 6,940 lux, which makes it brighter than a 1.2K HMI. That's quite staggering. So with the right Fresnel being made for this unit, you could get quite a bit of light level. Next, I tried the Aperture F10, and this was way too heavy. The lock-offs couldn't hold it, and I did some damage to the yoke. And the optical alignment was really terrible. You could actually see the barn door rings when you did a Fresnel cut. Now, ProLite are making a dedicated Fresnel for this unit, so I reckon a lot of people will be holding off to see what that can do. All right, so next up, let's take a look at their projector mount. So I'll just quickly run through how this works. So it's a polished uh, silver cylinder, uh, and it actually does have, different to other lights that uh, other modifiers that we've looked at, it actually does have some glass optics in it, not just a diffuser lens. So it is brighter than some other similar things that are out on the market. Now, um, this costs uh, about 600 Australian dollars. I can't find a US dollar price, so I'm guessing that'd be around 400 US bucks, but you do get a fair bit of stuff with it. So it's um, got a screw on steel lens cap, which brings memories back to my childhood because my dad had old cameras with screw on lens caps. Um, and the focus uh, here, you screw in and out to focus, so it's not a slider. So. Um, not sure if I like that or not. It's a little bit slow if you're at the wrong end of the um, at the wrong end of the barrel, but it really does help you get some real fine tuning on it. I have to say too, optically this is superb. Okay, it's 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 on a par with this with the dado. Okay, it's it's really superb. All right, so let's have a look at what you get for your money. So you get the the barrel and, and the lens. Um, you get a set of uh, gobos, so you get 16 gobos, and they're all very good patterns, all very usable patterns. Um, big negative for me, it's not a standard size gobo, so that's, that's, a, that's a negative for me, but 16 very good gobos. Um, you get, uh, what's in this box? Oh, now this is interesting. So you get the gobo holder, okay, so it slots in. You get a four leaf, um, four leaf set of blades, Okay, and that does have uh, the gobo holder as well. Okay, so you can put the gobo onto the back of this. Now there is a little catch with this. So I'll just put the gobo in. Now, as you can see on this side, um, the blades don't clear the gobo pattern. Right, so you do lose a bit of your gobo pattern on the edges because of the blades. And finally, I think it's in this box, Finally, you get an iris. So very, very smooth iris. And one thing I like is the iris is black, so you don't have light bouncing around inside your projection chamber. All right, so that, that, that helps a lot. And on the back of the iris is a gobo holder. And in this case, the iris does clear the gobo. Okay, so we've put it on the light, but before we fire it up, let's just get some perspective on things. So. Um, this here is the Dado Light DLED Turbo 7 with its projector. These two setups cost almost an identical amount of money. Okay, they're pretty much the same price. Now, this is bicolor, whereas this unit is full color. Okay, they've got almost identical optics, they're both extremely good, but this unit comes in at twice as bright. So, we're putting a positive spin on it, that would be my positive spin. Now here's the negative spin on it. The um, Orion 300 here outputs 2,510 lux at three meters with no modifier on it. And when you put on the projector mount, that drops down to 701 lux. So there is quite a lot of light level loss from here to this point. Okay, so pros and cons. Now the first thing I noticed with this, and it's not a, a positive or a negative, it's just an observation is the focal uh, range of this doesn't project or doesn't focus a great deal past the, uh, the gobo slot here or your iris slots. So um, the sort of the outcome of that is if you want to get that traditional circle uh, edge to edge very, very sharp, you can't do it with an empty barrel. Okay, so no matter, no matter where I focus to, I cannot get sharp edges on the, on the beam here. I cannot get a sharp edge. If I want to get a sharp edge, I have to drop in the iris, okay? So that's the only thing I've really noticed. 
All right, so you see here, I can't get the sharp beam edge, but if I go just a little bit in with the iris, now we're at sharps. All right, so let's have a look at the blades. And I've got to say, I do find it a bit awkward to get in, a little bit frustrating to get in, but once it's in, you're okay. So uh, hopefully I do this without swearing. All right, that's the pain out of the way. So a little bit, a little bit awkward to get in. Now, one thing I gotta say I do like um, about this compared to other projection mounts that, uh, or other, um, uh, other Bowen mount uh, projection mounts is you can actually rotate the barrel. Um, I, didn't, I didn't realize how much I missed being able to rotate a barrel until I, I started using a lot of LED projection mounts. Now, the blades are very independent of each other. So you've got a lot of control over all the individual blades. Let's rotate. I like my slashes going that way for some reason. All right, let's uh, see how fine a slash we can get. I'll just get that uh, in focus. Now we are overpowering um, the other lights in the room. Okay, so it does have a little bit of poke to it, but it's not a great amount of poke. So um, to give you an idea, uh, the 60, not the 60, the 300X, the Aperture 300X with its projector mounts about three times brighter than this. So this is a good usable amount of light, but it's not a heap. So let's have a look. Uh, let's get that a, a bit of a finer cut. I can get a finer cut than that. And let's go in and have a look at how fine a cut that is. So have a look at that. That is a fantastic cut and uh, chromatic aberration. Good luck seeing it. That is really, really clean. Okay, so let's go the same holder, but this time we'll pop a uh, gobo pattern into it, Venetian blind. All right, as you can see here, the, uh, the blades do overlap the gobo a little bit. All right, so let's, um, let's chuck a bit of a slash into this. Okay, there we go. Now, just something I'll show you. Um, Regardless of whether we're focused uh, forwards or backwards, there's no chromatic aberration. See, it's very clean, regardless of forwards or backwards focus. Now this time I've got an iris and gobo combination. So let's first off have a play with our HSI mode and see if we get any, any different color fringing as we go through our colors. So everything's equally as sharp regardless of color. So that's pretty good. And let's have a little bit of uh, play now with uh, defocusing and uh, using the iris. Oh, I don't like that. Let's go the other way. This is something I like to do. Now I did try the Orion 300 on the Aperture Spotlight mount and I couldn't get an even beam or an even focus. Now the light can run via a phone app, which you can download by scanning the QR code on the back of the light. Now the phone app seems pretty good, but I've given up on reviewing phone apps because I can't give you an accurate review of how they work when you're testing them with only one light. Now let's look at how the light runs from Lumen Radio DMX. All right, so let's test out the DMX response. So we're at 2000 Kelvin, and I'm gonna do an instant shut off. So that's good, it doesn't have any stepping up or any slow fading up, it's instantly on and off. Now let's do a five second fade to black starting now. So it's a little bit steppy at the end. Five second fade up. Now let's do a two and a half second fade to black. Two and a half second fade up. So now let's try a one second fade to black. And a one second fade up. Okay, now let's try a CCT sweep. So we're gonna go from 2000 Kelvin to 10,000 Kelvin in a five second sweep starting now. So that was pretty smooth. Let's sweep back the other way. Now let's do the same Kelvin sweep, 2,000 to 20,000 Kelvin in two and a half seconds. And let's try sweeping back in one second. Next test will go from 5,600 Kelvin 
and will fade in a color hue over five seconds, starting now. And we'll fade back to white starting now. Okay, let's do the same CCT hue cross in two and a half seconds starting now. And back. Now let's do a CCT to HSI switchover in one second. And switching back in one second. Now we'll try changing colors over DMX, five second transition programmed in. And we'll do the same command over two and a half seconds starting now. Now let's do some instant scene changes and see if the light engine struggles. All right, let's get into the technical side of the review, starting off with CCT accuracies. Between 2000 and 3000 Kelvin, it was accurate to typically plus 42 Kelvin on average. Between 3050 and 4000 Kelvin, it was typically accurate to plus 50 Kelvin. Between 4050 and 5000 Kelvin, it was accurate to typically plus 39 Kelvin. And between 5,050 Kelvin to 6,000 Kelvin, it was typically accurate to plus or minus 24 Kelvin. Now let's have a look at the TM3015 color vector scores. Between 2,000 Kelvin and 3,000 Kelvin, its lowest score was 90 and its highest score was 94, very respectable, with an average score of 92.1. Between 3,050 Kelvin and 4,000 Kelvin, it had an average of 93.4, which is very good. Between 4,050 and 5,000 Kelvin, it had an average score of 92.9. And between 5,050 and 6,000 Kelvin, it had an average score of 92.3. Now with TM30 color vector scores, anything above 90 is very good and anything around 95 is excellent. Now we'll have a look at its white point accuracy. So this gives you an indication of whether the light has any green or magenta hue cast in it. Now to give you some idea of scale, roughly 24 increments, that's 0.0024, is the equivalent of roughly a 1 8th correction gel. All right, so between 2000 and 3000 Kelvin, the closest it was was at 2000 Kelvin, right down the base, at minus 0.0003 delta UV. The most it was out by was minus 0.0042 delta UV which is uh, roughly the equivalent of being off-white by a one-quarter correction gel. The average uh, delta UV that it was out by in this range was 0.0027, which is roughly the equivalent of a one-eighth correction gel. Now, between 3,000 and 4,000 Kelvin, it was very good, with an average accuracy of minus 0.0010. Between 4,000 and 5,000 Kelvin, it was really good with an average accuracy of plus or minus 0.0006. And between 5,000 and 6,000 Kelvin, it also performed extremely well with an average accuracy of plus or minus 0.0007. Okay, let's take a closer look at some of our Kelvins. When I dialed in 2,000 Kelvin, I got 2,019 Kelvin. Now, despite a very anorexic looking waveform, it did have an impressive TM30 color vector score of 90. When I dialed in 3200 Kelvin, I got 3249 with a TM30 color vector score of 94% color rendition with 102% saturation. The SSI score was 80. Here are the individual CRI scores and only R12 is below 90%. Here is the wavelength analysis, and it's going to look a bit unusual because there's no white emitters. And the delta UV was a very respectable minus 0.0009. Now normally I take a reading at 4400 Kelvin because that's halfway between 3200 and 5600, but every time I took my finger off the knob, it just went to 4450. And after about 20 goes, I just gave up. So with 4,450 Kelvin as the target value, I got 4,487. With a TN30 color vector score of 93% with 102% saturation. Here are the individual CRI scores and only R12 is below 90. Here is the wavelength analysis. 
and the Delta UV was surprisingly accurate at minus 0.0004. When I dialed in 5600 Kelvin, I got a surprising 5604, with a TN30 color vector score of 93% color render and 101% saturation. Here are the CRI scores. Note that R12 is 76.2 and R9 is 86. Here is the wavelength analysis. And the delta UV came in at plus 0 0.0001, so virtually on the Planckian curve. Now let's have a look at how this thing dials in color vectors with no saturation. Red, which should be 0 or 360 degrees, came in smack on at 0. Green, which should be 120 degrees, was also smack on. And blue, which should be 240 degrees, came in at 241. Now let's take a look at our secondary color vectors. Yellow, which should be 60, came in at 26 but it actually does look like yellow. And if you have a look at the wavelength, it's got a lot of yellow there. That's the advantage of this thing not being RGB. Cyan, which should be 180, came in at 212. Magenta, which should be 300, came in at 254. Now let's have a look at our primary colors desaturated to 50%. Now, because this has a variable white point, I set the desaturation at 5,500 Kelvin and measured it against the D55 standard. Red came in at 3 degrees with 27% saturation. Green came in at 111 degrees with 24% saturation. Blue came in at 246 degrees with 72% saturation. Now let's have a look at our secondary colors at 50% saturation. Yellow came in at 27 degrees with 27% saturation. Cyan, which should be 180 degrees, came in at 212 degrees with 33% saturation. And again, take a look at the waveform here. It is not your typical RGB rubbish. And magenta, which should be 300 degrees, came in at 261 degrees with 54% saturation. Okay, so this has been a monster of a review for me to do because this thing has so much capabilities, it took forever to test it. So I'm always glad to see the back of a full color gamut light review. I hope the next one's just a monocolor light because they're a piece of cake. All right, see you on the next episode of Gaffering Gear. Take care, everybody.